Good evening from Ion Santa Barbara. This is Barbara Bartolome. Welcome everyone. We're happy to have you here tonight. Um, we're going to be talking just a little bit first off and thanking people who are wonderful contributors to the Ion Santa Barbara group when we meet monthly. And that's our board of directors. I'm Barbara Bartolome and I'm the director and the founder. And then there's also Dr. Jim Quacko, Danny Antman, Peter Wright, Jada Delaney, Sandy Fitzgerald, Albert Learn, and Claudia Logan. And all of these people contribute to our monthly meetings as well as our online meetings. And they are very, very thanked for doing that. Thank you, everyone. I want to let you all know that there's a conference happening. The IONS conference is going to be Unlocking the Healing Wisdom of Near-Death Experiences. It's going to be August 14th through 16th, and this year you guys have the best opportunity because you don't have to travel to go to Salt Lake City or Chicago or Philadelphia or Seattle to get the entire conference. It's going to be online. And the very cool thing is you don't have to spend hundreds of dollars to pay for your hotel and your travel costs. It's going to be $99 for all of the speakers. Plus, you'll be able to hear those speakers, their talks for 90 days, three months after the actual conference. So you won't have to worry about hearing them the day that they actually occur, which is August 14th through 16th. You'll be able to hear them for 90 days, three months. So there's going to be a deadline for the early bird cost of $99. So you're going to miss that cost if you don't. Register on IANS.org for the conference on or before July 15th. Your deadline is July 15th for that early bird fee. So everybody, go ahead, schedule yourself, and that is going to be awesome. The speakers are going to be amazing, including our speaker tonight, Kelvin Chin. So I want to introduce you to him. Kelvin is a life-after-life life expert. He does stress management and he's a meditation teacher. He's the executive director and founder of the Turning Within Meditation and Overcoming the Fear of Death Foundations. He's an internationally recognized meditation teacher featured in Business Insider, Newsweek, Kaiser Health News, and has taught meditation at West Point and in the U.S. Army, including on the DMZ in Korea. Kelvin is also the author of the best-selling book, Overcoming the Fear of Death, through each of the four main belief systems. It's a non-religious approach to the four beliefs that underlie all religious and cultural beliefs. He has had many experiences piercing the veil over the last 40 years, and his past life memories reach back 6,000 years. Kelvin was the featured speaker on opening night of the 2019 IONS conference in King of Prussia near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And he has spoken at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, Yale, Dartmouth and healthcare firms and is scheduled to speak as the 2020 IONS virtual conference that I was just speaking about. He's also speaking at the Voice of Our Angels, Helping Parents Heal Maui, East West Bookshop, IONS South Bay, San Francisco, and many others. He's a graduate of Dartmouth, Yale, and Boston College of Law and has lived in seven countries. Tonight he's going to discuss his book's four main belief systems, the non-religious beliefs that underlie all cultural and religious beliefs about death in the world. He will show how we can use this approach to help ourselves and others reduce and overcome our fears about death. Calvin will also unfold his afterlife experiences and insights his 1972 NDE, and his after-death communications since then with others in the afterlife. 
spiritual leaders, angels, archangels, and dead loved ones. What happens to us after we die? What choices do we have in the afterlife? Free will, soul contracts, what part of us is eternal? Those questions will be touched upon tonight. Based on his own personal experiences on the other side, Calvin will explain how understanding this can help us deepen our inner peace so that we can live life more fully now. Please help me in welcoming Calvin Chin. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thanks so much. Um, so yes, uh, my book, Overcoming the Fear of Death Through Each of the Four Main Belief Systems, I want to talk about that with everybody tonight and um, weave in some of my experiences and some of other folks' experiences that I um, talk about in the book um, and then develop our conversation together this evening and talk about the afterlife and what it's like and a little bit more specifics about that, about what it's like on the other side. Um, I know that this audience in particular, the IONS folks, um, you know, many of you have had your own experiences and so forth on the other side. Um, and certainly it's not an audience that we have to uh, uh, do a lot of convincing, uh, you know, with, with as it relates to um, uh, belief systems about whether there is an afterlife or not an afterlife. Um, that said, the discussion tonight, I, maybe you can look at it from a slightly different lens because um, I'm pretty sure that all of you have some sort of belief system that includes an afterlife. But look instead from other people's perspective and what can you potentially uh, hopefully take away that's practical from our discussion this evening together that may be useful for you when you're talking to other people who may not share the same beliefs that you do about whether there is an afterlife or what goes on in the in an afterlife if they do believe in an afterlife, etc. So um, I hope I can share some tidbits with you, some approaches, some perspectives, some tips, some points, and so forth as it relates to that, so that you can so they can help you with your in your just ongoing conversations with other people as well. So um, this is a picture of my book. And this is the same book. <laughs> uh, you got a copy of my book there. It's available in all the online distributors, uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, you name it. It's available around the world, um, in Asia, Australia, India, throughout Europe and the US, Canada, South America, et cetera. Um, and as Barbara said, the four main belief systems that we're going to get into in a minute are non-religious, so it's not religious or cultural belief systems that we're going to be talking about. You'll see what I what I mean when, when I unfold them in a second. But how did I get into this? How did I get involved with this whole arena of um, death and dying? Well, it was a very personal um, event, personal situation for me, why I started my nonprofit work in helping people overcoming the fear of death was my mom's death. And you can see that she was pretty young. She was in her 50s when she died. She was really the paragon of strength, of you know, powerful inner strength as a, as a, as a, as a woman um, in the United States. She came from China when she was three years old and went to Boston University. She was a chemistry major. She was really a Renaissance woman. She had a science background, but she was the number one uh, full of brush salesperson in the state of Massachusetts. She had a, managed like 10 people at one point, etc. She did jewelry. She created jewelry. She had her own seamstress making a uh, business, making wedding dresses, etc., etc. Her, her, her rock garden was featured in better homes and gardens in the late 1950s, early 1960s. She was really an amazing woman, but she was asymptomatic, right? Up to the point when she died and so it was really a shock to all of us uh and 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 i was very close with my mom so that's really what kind of catapulted me into into thinking about um death and dying in a much more intimate way you know i had had 
grandparents who had died and, you know, an uncle here or there or whatever. But um, this, my mom and I were very close. And so this was something that made me start to think about death and dying and my own mortality. And even though, as, as uh, Barbara alluded to, I had already by then uh, had my own past life memories, still, you know, when you don't have the loved one with you here and now, you miss them, right? We've all been through this, and I'm sure many of you have been through it personally, maybe even more than once in this lifetime. And so it doesn't matter if you believe in past lives, if you believe in an afterlife, that you're going to see them again, etc. You're not with them here now, right? And so it was really a, that watershed moment for me psycho-emotionally. Um, and it led to me helping other people. And now it's, it's up to 42 countries so far, helping people with death and dying issues um, and reducing their fears about death and dying. You know, death is the it's the proverbial elephant in the room, isn't it? <laughs> There's a funny cartoon about an elephant lying there on a psychiatrist's couch there or a psychotherapist's couch. Um, you know, nobody wants to talk about death. Um, but I, I thought about this, and I thought, we need to talk about this more. So how can we talk about it without getting into many arguments or debates about who's right and who's wrong about their religious beliefs about death or cultural beliefs about death and so forth. And, um, you know, one of the ways that you can kind of measure how much uh, a topic is really in the forefront of people's consciousness, um, whether they talk about it openly, publicly or not, is to look at humor. And I think I, I Googled this um, before I gave the talk at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. Those who may have may know about the, the Commonwealth Club is a, it's a very um, a well-known um, uh, private club in San Francisco. It's open to the public, but you have to be a member and so forth. But it's very educational. And there's different groups. And Hillary Clinton will go talk there, or Bill Clinton, or you know, Obama will go talk there, and 8,500, 10,000 people will show up. You know? um, but uh, I had an opportunity to speak there and uh, just as an example of uh, how much interest there is in death and dying, even though people don't talk about it, um, I talked to uh, one of my friends, George, and uh, he has an inside track there. And he said, well, I think I can get you in. But uh, the soonest is like a year and a half, two years from now uh, to speak there, because this is a club that's been uh, Teddy Roosevelt in 1903, when he was president of the United States, inaugurated it, so forth. That club's been around San Francisco for a long time. Uh, some of you, you may have heard their uh, the talks there are, are uh, sometimes, well, they're regularly uh, on NPR. Um, anyway, uh, George said, well, you, we get you a, a Monday at noon slot sooner than two years. So I think it was three months out. Because who wants to talk at Monday at noon when everybody's working? Is <laughs> nobody going to show up, right? So he he was managing my expectations, and he said, you know, if thirty people show up, uh, you know, that's a that's a that's a nice big crowd for a Monday noon talk. And uh, so he checked the the listing, and people have to register, they have to sign up. And uh, on on on, on um, Thursday, it was thirty people. Friday, close the business, it was up to forty people. And then, so I showed up, at, you know, a few days, a couple days later, Monday noon, and every seat was taken. 95 people showed up. It was standing room only. Three media outlets showed up. Business Insider showed up, uh, sent a reporter, interviewed me in the green room for an hour and a half afterwards, along with some Chinese uh, TV stations and so forth. So I was on the Chinese evening news for two minutes to, they said, 110 million people or something like that. Um there is interest in death and dying. It's very closeted. People don't talk about it. But before I, 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 I gave that talk, I Googled how many jokes there were about death and dying, because I thought humor, that's a good way to measure. You know, People may not talk about it, but they may be talk, telling jokes about it. And it was somewhere between 75 to 80 million Google hits I got. And of course, Woody Allen is, you know, we, we all, many of us know Woody from 
uh, movies uh, that he's that he's uh, produced, and directed, and so forth, written screenplays, etc. Woody is famous for saying, you you know, about death. He said, uh, "I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens." Right. So that's Woody. But um, besides humor, I thought, you know, how can we talk about this in a more serious way that doesn't step on people's toes, whether they be cultural or religious uh, belief systems that people hold? So I was talking to my buddy George, and we, we, we were brainstorming this, and we came up with these four belief systems that really underlie and support all the cultural and religious beliefs that exist in the world. Everybody falls somewhere in the spectrum. So here's... Uh, here, here are the four beliefs. First belief system, no afterlife. One life, this is it. You, 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 your brain and your mind are connected. When your brain dies and shuts off, your mind shuts off. That's the first belief system. Second belief system that exists in the world, I call it the fear of continued existence. So people who have the second belief believe in an afterlife, but there's some fear there. And there may, fear may be... Uh, the source of the fear may be for various reasons, okay? Third belief system, beliefs in afterlife, but no fear, maybe even looking forward to it. Fourth belief system, reincarnation, past lives. You can have future lives. You can decide to come back if you want to, all of that stuff, okay? Have a new, new physical body and so forth. Your mind uh, consciousness goes into that new body. Those are the four belief systems, all right? Everybody falls somewhere in that spectrum you may be a fence sitter. You may be a hybrid person, like I call them fence sitters. Maybe you have uh, the first and the second. There's a lot of people I help worldwide in the 42 countries so far that who I've helped uh, who contact me um, who are fence sitters. Most of them are first, second belief systems uh, people. They think that this is it. And they say, but I'm not sure. Maybe there's oblivion that happens afterwards, or I'm not sure what, you know, so there's, there's this doubt this is fear of uncertainty is really what it distills down to. Again, just to kind of review all these beliefs, um, my dad's belief, let's talk about each of them a little bit more detail, each of the four beliefs. The science belief, call it, right? That's a picture of my dad. Uh, uh, he looks like he's in his 40s there, my dad. Um, I'm going to tell some more stories about my dad in the context of our talk tonight. I tell a lot of stories in the book, it's a, a very much a, a story-filled book. Very easy read. Uh, by the way, it's it's available, as I said, um, paperback, obviously, uh, but also ebook, and it's uh, also available as an audio book. And I do the narration of the of the book. Uh, the second belief system: fear of continued existence. As I said earlier, this basically distills down to the fear of uncertainty, doesn't it? It's it's the fear of the unknown. We're not exactly sure what happens. Even if you've had an NDE, you might still have a fear of continued existence slightly there because that fear of the unknown is there until it's not unknown anymore. I tell people that we're, we're all going to know at that most intimate moment of our life, which is at that moment where, the, where our, 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 our body shuts off our physical, biological body dies, that's when we're going to know. Either one of two things is going to happen. Either our mind's going to continue or it's going to discontinue, right? So when I'm talking about the first belief, the science belief with folks, I say, first of all, let's define fear. What's fear? Fear is the emotion caused by the anticipation of unhappiness. So my dad actually was a firm, full believer in the first belief, the science belief. He said, this is it. My dad used to say, uh, stick me in a box, throw the dirt at me, I'm done. That's it. So my dad had no fear about death because his belief firmly was the first belief system. And if you really do have the first belief system, you don't have any anticipation of unhappiness because you don't believe that the anything's going to happen afterwards, right? So... It's illogical to have any fear if the person claims to be a first belief system believer. So if you hear people say this to you, you know that they're really a hybrid. They probably have some or maybe a lot of this second belief system 
there that they are unaware of. So you can help them by pointing that out to them. And then you can refer them to me if you, you know, run out of stuff to talk about. But I'm going to give you a whole bunch of points to share with them uh, this evening, hopefully. Uh, again, what's the solution for the fear of continued existence? Basically, it's a twofold solution. It's the turning within and then strengthening virtue. What does that mean? We'll talk about this in a second. But turning within through some means. So as you heard Barbara say, I teach a meditation technique. I've been teaching for 47 years now. Thousands of people all over the world. Uh, taught the first meditation courses in the history of West Point Military Academy. Uh, two to 300 people there. Uh, taught the first uh, meditation courses up on the DMZ, the militarized zone, and throughout South Korea and the U.S. Army, and then all, throughout uh, all the U.S. Air Force bases in South Korea as well. Um, turning within is what I call the meditation technique that I talk about now. But you could turn it, turn within through many different other techniques. You don't only have to learn my technique in order to turn within. But that's the first step. We need to turn within, connect within ourselves. Those of you who have had NDEs have, have turned within uh, uh, kind of spontaneously, right? That's what an NDE is. It spontaneously happens. You're not trying to have an NDE. Uh, and, it, and, and that sponta spontaneous turning on of your own turning within resulted in your near-death experience. But the issue then becomes, how can we turn within on a regular basis through a technique, for example, the technique that I teach, or you, some of you may practice some other meditation techniques, on a regular, consistent basis. That's what's going to help chip away at this fear of continued existence, the fear of uncertainty at the basis of that, okay? In addition to strengthening virtue, as I said. So what do I mean by virtue? Here's what I don't mean. I don't mean what most people in 20th century and 21st century planet Earth think about virtue. Most people think about virtue, they think about do's and don'ts. Oh, you should be this way. Oh, then you're a virtuous person. Oh, don't do that because then you're not a virtuous person. That's not what we mean. That's not what I mean by virtue when I'm talking about virtue. I'm talking about it uh, in the way Jesus used the, the, the idea of virtue or the ancient Greeks used the word uh, virtue virtuous okay so in ancient greece the idea was turn within connect with oneself strengthen oneself from the inside out that was the approach in ancient greece and the same thing i say jesus just i'm picking jesus because we live in a christian country but whether you're christian or not i work across all cultures and religions muslims hindus sikhs jews you name it um but the idea of knowing thyself is cuts across all cultures and all religions. The idea of know thyself, turning within and knowing thyself is a, is a common thread. That's what I mean when I say virtue. Okay? And the idea is that if we really are connecting within ourselves, turning within, connecting with ourselves in this virtuous way, the way I just defined virtue, then we end up expanding outside of what I call the supermarket aisle mind. That's a supermarket aisle, if you're wondering what that is. Uh, those are a bunch of cans. And, and supermarket. Um, and, and, and I call it the supermarket aisle. Why do I call it that? Because that part of our mind, which is a very important part of our mind, um, you know, sometimes you hear people in spiritual circles, they kind of denigrate, they they they. they they downplay or they speak almost uh, sarcastically or negatively about our conscious thinking mind. No, I think that's a mistake. We, our conscious thinking mind is a very important part of our mind. If we don't have our conscious focusing, directing part of our mind, you get out in a car and you're going to get in a car accident, right? Uh, walking down the stairs, trip, carrying all your Amazon boxes down to your dumpster. Everybody's buying stuff online these days, right, with COVID. Uh, 19 situation so we need to focus focusing is an important part of our mind the issue is not that it's bad the issue is that it's limited that's the issue and i think choice of our words in how we describe these different uh, uh perspectives about our mind 
is very important because negative uh, words create negative attitude and attitude affects us, our consciousness. And, and so if we're looking to expand our consciousness, expand our capacity of mental experience outside of the supermarket aisle mind, that conscious thinking part of our mind that walks down the supermarket aisle. And I, do I need tomatoes? Do I need uh, more soy sauce? Do I need broccoli today? You know, that's what I call the supermarket aisle mind. It's we're making decisions. We're focusing. Okay. That's an important part of our mind. But how can we expand outside of that supermarket aisle, that conscious focusing part of our mind, expand our capacity for human experience? That's what I mean when I talk about turning within and virtue, turning within, expanding our conscious capacity for experience, knowing thyself in the ancient Greek sense, in the Shakespearean sense, in the Jesus sense, in the in the the, the Buddhist Buddhist sense, etc. Okay. Um, here's a very succinct definition of virtue: inner spiritual confidence and strength. That's what virtuous person is to me. That's how I use the word virtue. That's how the ancient Greeks used the word. Uh, the ancients used the the word virtue. Um, you can read more about this. You can there's a website there, 30thnovember.com. I'm not going to talk about that this evening, uh, but there's a, there's a his, the history of spirituality in the Judeo-Christian, Islamic, and Vedic traditions. Those four traditions on planet Earth over the last 10,000 years. There's a talk that's there at that website that you can check out. But there's a letter specifically that was written December 25th, 2014, uh, right after that talk that was given talk specifically about virtue in this way, inner spiritual confidence and strength. Okay? That's how you get rid of that, that, that the fear of continued existence. We have to turn within. We have to balance out our cortisol levels, our lactic acid, our brain and our blood chemistry. Look, I'm speaking to an audience I know right now that, as I already said, believes in an afterlife. That means that we believe that our mind continues, our mind, soul, spirit, consciousness. By the way, just to be crystal clear, those are all synonymous as far as the way I use the word mind. I'm not talking about the supermarket aisle mind when I say the word mind. I mean that plus. It's fluid. There aren't these parts of our mind. It's a fluid. All our consciousness is fluid. Um, but it's energy, right? And so... Um, the, but the body does affect our mind, our consciousness. So, so we do need to take care of our body. So back to the, you know, how are we getting rid of, how do we neutralize and, and d diminish, reduce, and hopefully eliminate this fear of continued existence? It's by turning within, strengthening ourselves. But that means also psycho-emotionally and physically paying attention to our body working out, exercising, eating well, not eating junk junk food and so forth. We need to take care of our physical structure in order to maximize our mental consciousness potential. All right? So just a reminder on that. Uh, the third belief, let's talk about this. The third belief, as I said earlier, afterlife with no fear, um, whether you believe in afterlife, as, as heaven, or you call it Valhalla, you call it Nirvana, different cultures, different religions refer to it in different terms, okay? Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, which terminology, that's why I use afterlife, because as I said, I, I work across cultures and so forth, so I try to use more neutral uh, words. Um, so let's talk about glimpses of the other side. Um, OBEs, out-of-body experiences, NDEs, near-death experiences, and STEs, spiritually transformative experiences. So again, um, I think there's a, I think there's a, it can be a, viewed as a progression. Those of you who have out-of-body experiences, whether in meditation or whether just in sleeping, or whether you know people have had, can have out-of-body experience in any waking, dreaming, or sleeping or meditating states. It doesn't matter when it can happen but you can feel outside of your limited supermarket aisle self that I was talking about earlier, right? And um, that's, I think those are uh, examples 
uh, of a glimpse to the what I call the other side, because to me, the other side is not far away. It's right here. And we'll talk more about that when we get into uh, experiencing the afterlife and so forth, um, uh, which is can be experienced in this life, as we'll talk about through some of the STEs that I've had. NDEs, near-death experiences. Okay, I'm talking to an audience who well knows the, you know, all, the full range of NDEs. There's no one type of NDE, near-death experience, that is the NDE. There are many types, types of NDEs, and I'm sure many of you have had NDEs yourself or know people who, who have had NDEs. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of NDEs in a second, just to give you a perspective on the range, and I'll tell you about my near-death experience, which is different still. Uh, STEs, spiritually transformative experiences. That's basically, for those of you who have, heard that who have not heard that terminology before, that's just a catch-all to me. It's just a catch-all. Anything that kind of, it's not an OBE, it's not an NDE. It's like a spiritual experience that, you know, you go, wow, <laughs> that's different. <laughs> that falls into that category, okay? So uh, let's talk about some near-death near experiences. So I almost drowned when I uh, was 20 years old, all right? Uh, my near-death experience was a little bit unusual uh, from the usual near-death experiences you either read about, you've had perhaps yourself personally or heard about or seen on YouTube. Um, and I think my near-death experience was different because I'd already been meditating for two years and had many out-of-body experiences or experiences of, we'll call it separation of my mind, my, my body and mind, my body and consciousness. Uh, remember how I'm using mind in the sense of consciousness, soul, spirit, whatever, awareness. Um, that difference between the two was, was a, was a, was a common experience in me by the time I'd been meditating for two years, every day, twice a day. Um, so when I had this almost drowning experience in, uh, right off of San Diego, um, those of you, I'm not sure you know, if any of you are, are uh, familiar, um, maybe if you've lived down there or know people who live down there, but there's rip, there's rip currents. There's rip currents up and down the coast here. You know, I mean, I'm talking to a group that's primarily Santa Barbara right now. So you guys know. I mean, um, there are rip currents, you know, and basically it's a street, it's a river in the ocean uh, that you cannot see when you're right in it, right? You can see it from up high, but you can't see it from when you're at uh, surface level. And uh, I, I'd never been to the West Coast before when I was 20 years old, and I was going to a summer school program, an intensive language program uh, at UCSD in La Jolla. And I uh, went swimming with somebody I met at registration, and she and I so, and she was from the East Coast, too, uh, ironically, uh, interestingly. So we didn't know anything. We didn't know what a rip current was. And, and we, we stood in the water at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and I got pulled out 1.7 miles in about 30, 40 seconds. She must have been right on the edge of the rip, and I just saw her getting smaller. And those of you who know, uh, you know, uh, Torrey Pines Beach, you know, it's a state, it's a state beach there. Uh, Torrey Pines is 300-foot-high cliffs there. Um and I saw those 300 foot high cliffs and they were about three inches tall uh, in about, I don't know, I wasn't timing myself. I basically I was freaking out, I, I, to, truth be told. I was just panicking, I was freaking out. But you know, I don't know, it was like 30, 40 seconds, very quickly, uh, they, they were about three inches tall. So my friend who's a you know, navigator, a, you know, a ship captain, he said 1.7 miles, that's how far out I was. I started swimming in and I did the exact wrong thing. So just a little educational point for everybody here. Do not swim straight in like I did because you're, I'm going right against the current and I'm getting exhausted, right? What you're supposed to do, I, I forgot all my Boy Scout training, and, and you're supposed to swim at a 45-degree angle to the shore, increasing the probability that you're going to get out of the rip current. It just pulled you out. So um, I get exhausted. I start going down. And I see, just like in the movies, you know, I could see the surface of the water. I'm holding my breath, but I could see the surface of the water because I'm so exhausted. You know, foot, not six inches, a foot, two feet, you know, three feet. I don't know what. And then I left my body. And so I was out of my body, just like in the meditations. And I, and I, and I but I, for a split second, 
but I, I willed myself back into the body. And so I didn't have a classic near-death experience, which I'm going to talk more about in a second, some of these other ones. But I, I willed myself right back in because I knew at that, I had this split second, I knew that I could, I could will myself back in. And I'm going to come back later in our discussion and tell you how I knew that I could will myself back into my body from another spiritually transformative experience uh, that I had had. We'll get to that later. But I, I knew I could will myself back into my body and, and, then I, and make a decision to just chill. Chill out, do not panic, and just take my time. And all of those thoughts were not, they didn't come, come out, they came out, even come out that fast. They came out faster. They came out in a millisecond. All of that knowingness, I would call it, came into my mind. And I forced myself, I willed myself, I forced myself to pull all of whatever level of energy I still had left in me to the, get to the surface, those several feet to the surface. And I, and I, and I swam in and I took my time. I, and, 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 and my friend said, she, she stood there to watch me. She didn't want to leave me. And she said, it took me about an hour to swim in. I was exhausted. I pulled myself up. I crawled in up to the shore, like on my hands and knees. And I passed out. She said, I fell asleep for about a half an hour. I just passed out. I was exhausted. That was my near death experience. It was an unusual one, right? But I, 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 I'm a firm believer that Monday morning quarterbacking, hindsight 2020, that my two years of meditation saved my life. Because if I had hesitated anymore, I would have been 12 feet, 15 feet down, and there's no way that my exhausted body could have struggled to get to the surface at that point. All right? Unusual near-death experience, right? Um, but, but I use that as a teaching point to illustrate how powerful meditation can be in terms of bridging our experiences. Um, Henry's tonsils. Uh, my friend Henry, uh, we were friends in college uh, together and lived in the same dorm and so forth. Later in, at, in graduate school, uh, we were roommates together in graduate school. Um, apartment mates, but he told me when we were whatever, 20, 19, 20 years old, that he died when he was eight, or he, they thought he died. And what happened was he had his tonsils out. I tell the longer version of this in my, uh, this story in my book. Um, but the short version is he was eight years old. He had his tonsils out successfully, comes back home and his mom gives him a cookie. And it was baked too crispy. And it ripped out his sutures in the back of his throat. And he's hemorrhaging. And the doctors can't, you know, this is back in the old days. Some of you may be old enough, as old as I am, you know, you know, back in the days when doctors actually made house calls. And the doctor came right over to the house. Mom called the doctor. Came right over to the house and said, no, he's too far gone. Uh, uh, lost too much blood. Can't, ambulance will take too long. Put him in the. Put, he put the doc, uh, The doctor put him in, in the mom and, and Henry in the backseat of the car, and took him to the hospital and saved his life. Meanwhile, the whole time Henry said he was on the ceiling of the living room, looking at his eight-year-old body, wondering what everybody was freaked out about. He felt fine. He was completely at peace. All of the stuff that you've read about, heard about, maybe even had yourself in your near-death experience. Um, this is more of a classic kind of near-death experience. He's on the ceiling. He's on the ceiling of the car. He's in the ceiling of the surgery room at the hospital, told his mom who said what to whom, you know, who, what, what clothes the doctors were wearing, what color his necktie sticking up above his, his PPE, his protective gear, you know, his, the clothes he's wearing and so forth in the surgery room, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. That's what, that's, that's a more classic NDE than, than, than what I experienced, right? Jay, my friend Jay Peters was dead for 20 minutes. Again, there's a much longer version of this in the book, uh, my book, but the short version, 20 minutes. Those of you who know anything about healthcare, the physical physiology of the body, four to six minutes. That's about as long as you can be dead with no, no brain activity, no breathing, no heartbeat, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Pretty much four to six minutes is it if you Google it. And even if you come back after six minutes, 90 something percent of the time, you've got brain damage. 
you know, some kind of brain issues and so forth. Um, Jay came, he was dead for 20 minutes in a hospital room, all wired up. There's hospital records. I've talked to his doctor. I've actually had his, one of the doctors, uh, uh, I've had dinner with him twice and talked with him on the phone many times and so forth. Um, he coded in the room after having been, uh, he was already in the ICU for, for 20, uh, for, for, for a, uh, for a week. And then he was, uh, for another several days, he was in this, whatever they call that in the hospital, the next stage before they, they want to monitor you, you know, before they let you out, um, before they release you, discharge you. So, um, he was in that second level. So they go, like, Oh, he's out of the woods. Okay, great. Our mutual friend, Diane was sitting next to him, uh, his hospital bed and, um, uh, he coded, he flatlined. So she yells coded, you know, in the hallway, eight, 10 no doctors and nurses all come, you know, running down in, you know, they do all the thing, the paddles, they give him the shot, the whole thing. he's dead for 20 minutes. Jay told me that he left his body immediately. He was out in space, no tunnel of light, no nothing, just in space, very different experience. That's why I picked these two to talk about in my talk sometimes. Because very different from Henry's experience, he's in outer space. Jay said he said he could see more stars than the darkest night in the, you know, the hinterland woods of outside Seattle. They, he's from Seattle, Washington, um, and Starfield. He said, and then the next thing he heard was some what he called some lilting music. This is a phrase that I never use. Lilting music he heard. So pleasant lilting music. Turns out Diane was sitting next to his bed in the Seattle hospital singing to him. Um, and so he heard this and he liked it. So his mind is a teaching uh, point for you. His desire of his mind started making him go towards the source of this song that he liked. Little did he know he was going back towards planet Earth, right? His, his mind, his consciousness was bodies there in the hospital bed, obviously dead for 20 minutes. Uh, they kept doing this thing where, where the doctors were saying, okay, the official time of that. And then Diane would make something up like he's just moved again. And they were all what? And then <laughs> she was just making it up because she was getting messages from the other side saying, he's coming back. He's coming back. Tell them something. So she was psychically connected to the other side, getting at, getting communications from the other side while this is all going on. Okay. Uh, he starts going towards it, and then he starts moving really fast. You may ask, how does he know he's really fa moving fast? He's in outer space or some, what he described as space. Uh, there's no physical objects he can see that are near him. How does he know he's going fast? All of a sudden, he said, all these beings appeared around him, he said. And they kind of formed like a tunnel, like a, well, like they're, like a crowd on either side of him, like a, you know, like a chute. And he started going down between them. And they're just stationary and they're all kind of in robes and he recognized some of them and did not recognize most of them. There were hundreds, he said, maybe thousands. He wasn't sure, but a lot all of a sudden. And they're kind of there watching him go <laughs> shooting down between uh, the, the two, the two groups. And, and that's how he knew his relative motion. He was moving really, really fast and faster and faster and faster. And the next thing he knew he was back in his body. He sat bolt upright said, where am I, Diane? Who are these people? And what am I doing here? And everybody, eight to 10 doctors and nurses, they all scream. They all scream. It didn't matter how young, how old, everybody screamed because this is a guy who's been dead for 20 minutes. Unheard of, right? So that was Jay's NDE. And there's more details of that. I give more details. That's just a quick version of it. But again, I don't need to belabor this area because you guys all know about near-death experiences, right? So let's talk about communications with dead loved ones. Um, this is another element that I talk about in my book when I'm talking about the third belief system, just to remind you what the context is here. We're talking about the third belief system, which is the belief in an afterlife, but no fear, okay? So many of you have probably had some communications in some way with dead loved ones uh, on the other side, or maybe people who you don't know uh, from the other side as well. 
uh, could be angels, could be archangels, could be uh, spirit guides, um, maybe not people, in other words, loved ones uh, who you've been with in this lifetime who have predeceased you. So there are many other sources, but we'll just put it under this general category of communications with dead loved ones. Um, and I and I picked a few of the examples um, that uh, a couple of which I talk about in my book. But I, I wanted to give you kind of a range, just from a teaching perspective, of different uh, ways that we can be communicated with uh, from the other side. So the no smoking in heaven is. Um, is, is in my book, uh, and it's an experience that I actually had. Uh, so most of the experiences I'm talking in my book, I'm talking about other people's experiences because I don't want to make the book about me. Uh, I want to keep people focused on the teaching points in the book. Um, but this one it happens to be about an experience that, that I did have while I was in Aust living in Austin, Texas. So this experience happened, I want to say, um, oh, about four or five years ago or so. Um, and I was uh, just lying in bed, minding my own business, and uh, uh, living. I, was, I lived alone. And uh, you know how that experience, you have that, you know, somebody, you feel the presence of somebody. And, and maybe it's a physical presence of somebody. Like maybe you're, you, you, you're kind of falling asleep or, you know, on the couch in the, the living room or you're kind of half asleep. And then your, your husband or your wife comes up next to you and you can kind of feel their presence and there and you open your eyes both and they're there. Right. Well, this was just like that, except I opened my eyes up and there was nobody there <laughs> and you know, felt that presence, that kind of a thing. Um, and some of you may have uh, this experience. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I closed my eyes again and then this person started talking to me or this being, this mind, this consciousness, whatever, the soul started talking to me. And it was, and for some reason, I knew it was a he. I don't know, just intuitively, I just had the knowingness that it was a male. And he started telling me a message to give to his sister, Nancy, who lives in Phoenix, Arizona, who's a friend of mine. And she said, I give this message to Nancy. Um, I'm her brother. And he gave me a personal message to give her and so forth. Um, but the, he told, these, told me these two random things. One is no smoking, there's no smoking here. <laughs> That's why I call the the, the section heading uh, for the story in the book. I call it "No Smoking in Heaven." He said, "There's no smoking here." That was like totally weird. Like what? And nobody has ever said that. I've had I've had thousands of communications with beings on the other side uh, since 1986. Nobody's ever said there's no smoking here. He said, "There's no smoking here." And and the other thing is, he showed me. You have that. He had that experience. Many of you have had the experience. A TV screen goes on in your mind, and you can visually see stuff. It was like that, right? And so he, TV screen goes on my mind. He shows me, uh, I, I, it's like a video. And I see him coming out of a San Diego nightclub with his sister and they're laughing and it's nighttime because I can see the uh, parking lot lights uh, in the parking lot where they are. Um, and they're coming out from a San Diego nightclub laughing. And he told me it's in San Diego at Hotel Circle, right off of Route 8. Uh, coincidentally, I happen to live, I used to live in San Diego, so I know exactly where he was talking about. Um, two random things, really random. So I call, so I, call, I talk to my friend Nancy, right? And I say, Nancy, you know, he had this message for you. I, your brother, I think it's your brother. He came, talked to me, blah, blah, blah. It's two random things. Like, what was this? No smoking. She, she said, oh, he hated cigarette smoke. He absolutely hated it. He said in the 1980s, long before there were no smoking sections, he would go around and ask people to stop smoking, even in bars, not just restaurants and in trains and buses. He would go, he'd go up to the people in bars and ask them to stop smoking. He would really tick people off. He hated cigarette smoke. I said, well, what about the San Diego nightclub thing? She goes, oh, wow. She, she started, I could hear it. She started crying. She's choking up. Uh, she said, it was the last time I saw him alive. I she had flown to San Diego to visit him. They went out to a San Diego nightclub, and I didn't know this, but he was voice trained. He studied voice in college and so forth. He had a really good voice, evidently. And he had just sung karaoke in the nightclub and got a standing ovation. And they were laughing about it as they were leaving the, the, the nightclub to go to their car. 
she said two weeks later, he killed himself by suicide. Two weeks later. I get a chill when I say that sometimes. Um, that was the last time she saw him alive. Um, so it was, I think, his way of t letting her know that, in fact, it was it was he who was coming to me. So that's the no smoking in heaven communication. Um, again, more details on that story as well. There's other things that happen. Uh, but that, those are the high points. Um, perfume. I'm sure some of you have had this experience where you wake up from a dream and the room reeks of perfume of your grandmother or your mother or your the after you know shaved cologne of your dead dad who wore, wore way too much aqua velva you know uh you know you ever been with guys this is a tip for any guys listening here do not put your cologne on your clothes you want to put some here right i i know i know some people who put it on their clothes to, like it just it's way too strong don't overdo it anyway you wake up wake up uh, from a dream and it's like you just were with them your dead loved one and in your room, your bedroom, reeks of their perfume or their aftershave, their cologne or whatever. You know, that's a, that's a communication with a dead loved one. So don't doubt that. That's them communicating with you in that way. So in a different way from the experience that I had the communication, you know. Another one, uh, lights on in the car. So, um, you know, just turning lights on anywhere, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had had this um i help people die also literally uh just so you know a little bit about my nonprofit work one of the things that i do is i i am with people virtually or literally at their bedside so sometimes virtually i a woman in, in london england whose mother um you know was holding on longer than the than the do doctors thought was physically possible given how much morphine that they had given her she should have been dead from the morphine they said, but she was holding on, and the woman held the phone up next to her. The, the daughter held the uh, a smartphone up next to her ear in London, England. And I talked to her for 15 minutes, and she she hadn't spoken in two weeks. And she said one word to her daughter afterwards. She said "beautiful," and then she went into a coma the next day and died 48 hours later. So um, I help people in that way. So you may. Um, hear me tell stories sometimes like this one the lights on in the car where i helped uh jimmy um die i was in his house actually at the moment he did die um and i had talked to him i had knelt down next to he was incapacitated you know in bed so i couldn't get up out of bed anymore and i knelt down next to him and had a conversation with him about death and dying and so forth and um we explored the possibility of an afterlife at that point in our conversation. And I planted the seed in his head. And I said, Jimmy, you wanted to come back and communicate with Donna. His wife was named Donna. Uh, you could play with lights, I think, you know, because if you do continue, then you're energy, right? And what's energy? Electricity. So, uh, so maybe that's something easy for you to play with because you are energy. So just plant that seed. I planted the seed in his head. And I said, now nah, you just you know think about that and then sure enough after he died he's been playing with electricity uh immediately after he died lights on turning lights on and donna's car at night she'll say uh, should be alone you know not touching the overhead lights right in you know interior lights right over the you know right next to your rearview mirror there um and she'll say jimmy is that you and then the light will turn off by itself and it'll turn the other one will turn on on her and she goes, she said, Jimmy, stop playing with me. Turn the lights off and they'll turn the lights off. So that kind of thing. Or she'll be reading in bed, turning lights on, electricity, easy for people to do on the other side. Another one, feathers or coins. Feathers is another one. Finding feathers, favorite birds, unusual birds, not lots of them. They, they do exist perhaps in that person's environment, obviously, but there's a thousands more other birds and yet this one kind of bird feather keeps showing up that's another way for people to communicate with us from the other side or coins i i talked to one woman uh last year and she was telling me before her father died she said dad you know if you're going to send me coins to let me know that you're okay 
happens to say hi to me every once in a while. No, no pennies or nickels. I want quarters. So she gets quarters. <laughs> they had an agreement beforehand. <laughs> so here's here's some uh, specific experience that uh, ha happened to me with my dad. You remember what I told you at the beginning about uh, my dad, right? First belief system. One life, my dad was famous for saying to anybody, whether he knew you or not, stick me in a box, throw the dirt on me, I'm done. And he always he used to have cigarettes out of his mouth. Then he, had, when he graduated to cigars, hanging out on the side of his mouth. Okay, so in 1999 he died. The, we we met over there. Here's the quick version of the story. Uh, this is also in my book, but the quick version uh, is that he died. We cremated him. He wanted to be. He was. You could see him in his World War II uniform there. He wanted to be buried in the military cemetery. So we took him to the military cemetery in Hawaii. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the night, the funeral service at the cemetery, I took my daughter up to the, uh, you know, after we ordered Chinese food down in the restaurant in the lobby, all my brothers and sisters and their kids and blah, 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 everybody's there. I said, I'm going to take Sammy up and rinse her off. I took her up, rinsed her off, got the sand off the beach, you know, all of that. Uh, changed her into pajamas, came down, we ate. A couple hours later, we go up. I take her up before everybody, she's the youngest, and uh, she's five years old at the time. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, my sister took everybody, to the other kids and everybody to the gift shop. Okay, we're up there. The room is wide open. The door is wide open. It's magnetized. It's one of those door stops. It's a magnet. Magnetized, wide open. The pitch black room. Nothing is taken. My scuba diving, uh, you know, uh, regulator is right there on the suitcase next to the front door. There's four of us in there, so we got a room full of suitcases spread out and mines. The one right inside the door. Nobody's touched anything. You know, the, the guys come up. The security guys come up. They check everything. They can check plug in their keyboard into the door, they can see that my key was the last key at quarter of eight that um, unlocked the door. I'm sorry, Mr. Chin, we can't explain it. And I said, oh, we're, this is crazy. You know, we're doing this um, ceremony for my dad who died tomorrow morning. And they both looked at me, two Hawaiian guys looked at me and they said, dude, it's your dad. He's playing with you, right? That was the first thing. The second thing was the next morning we wake up and I go in the, 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 the safe to get my um, wallet out. I get my wallet because we're going downstairs to get a breakfast and then come back and get our luggage and check out of the hotel. I get my wallet, close the safe. I go, oh, forgot. We have four free coupons, free breakfast. That's real money in Waikiki, Honolulu. It's expensive there, right? Those of you have been. So I, 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 I'm going to get those coupons. So, I, so I, two seconds later, I go to punch the key code into the safe. It doesn't work. No electricity. I asked my son, Jesse, uh, check the lights, you know, bathroom, the you know, the headboard of the bed. Everything works except right there, the, the TV and the safe and the refrigerator. So I look in the back behind the big, heavy piece of furniture, power strip, and I didn't touch it. I looked at it very carefully because of what happened the night before, and I looked at the on-off switch. It was 100% completely off. It wasn't loose connection a little bit it was completely pushed off i pushed it on well got my uh coupons we went down at breakfast the third thing that happened was what do you think the waiter's name who waited on us in this very busy 15 to 20 waiters and wait waitresses wait people down down there of course it's my father's name right the waiter had my father's name so my dad visiting us i think so Here's what happened. This one happened to a client of mine just last year, last fall. This is about, what, eight months old, this story. This is very recent. So as I said, my father was in World War II. Uh, India and China, B-29, that's a B-29 bomber right there. Um, <clears throat> my client, Joseph, who I've never met, lives, I think, in Ohio, um, texted me and... Um, he said, I think your dad came and visited me in my your, 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 my, my dreams last night. I said, what? And so I just called him up. And he said, what? I said, what, what happened? He said, 
Well, I had this dream, and this guy has very clear lucid dreams. And he said, in the dream, I'm flying a, B, a, 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 a World War II bomber over the ocean. He was flying it. Joseph was flying it. And he said this young Asian officer came from the rear of the plane up, up, up to the cockpit, and we were talking about hydraulics in the engines, and if ever all the hydraulics were fine, blah, 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 working. Up. And he said, yep, all the hydraulics are fine. We had a conversation about the plane. The mechanics of the plane. My father was a mechanical engineer. Um, and and then this young Asian army officer said to Joseph, you have a fear of death, don't you? And Joseph said to him in the dream, how do you know that? There's only six people in the world who know that I have a fear of death. And I just told the other person uh, three weeks ago, and the young Asian officer said, oh, you mean my son, Kelvin? That's my son. A little emotional. And um, there you go. Unusual experience, right? Uh, so I think my father, <laughs> my father had a little surprise when he died. My father, the firm believer, at first belief system believer, right? A little surprise after he died. <laughs> He's visited us a number of times since, uh, including my daughter. My daughter's name is Samantha. She's 25 now. This happened to her a few months ago. This is recent. This is my picture of my daughter's laptop. This is a screenshot she took of her laptop. I'm not sure if you can see this, but I'll read it to you. Um, she, my daughter was reading an article. Uh, my daughter's a, a, a model and uh, dancer and so forth. She's a, a model with Wilhelmina. Uh, if you, you know, you know about modeling agencies, Wilhelmina in New York City. And she was reading an article about modeling, whatever. And uh, this randomly popped up on her screen. She didn't touch any key, key, keys on her keyboard, nothing. This popped up with these five names popped up on her screen. David, Bloom, Holly, Henry, King, Sam. Okay? Sam is her, right? Those are five dead loved ones who communicate with her often. David, her high school friend, Dee Dee Bloom, who's um, the partner of Sam's aunt, um, Holly, a uh, friend who died, Holly was 15 years old when, and Sam was 10 years old when Holly died. Henry's my dad, King's my mom. King is the anglicized version of my mom's Chinese name. Um, random, a few months ago. Another form, just from a teaching standpoint, a form of communication from the other side. Okay? So there you go. That's, that's kind of overview of the third belief system. And then the fourth belief system, reincarnation, past lives, future lives, soul contracts, various types of relationships, and so forth. It could be family, friends, business relationships, and so forth, that we may want to come back and have in a future life. So real quick, how do the, sur how do the memories surface? Basically, um, you know, most people know what deja vu is, right? You're sitting there, you're having coffee, you're having a you know, juice or whatever, a smoothie with a friend. Yeah, oh, wait, I feel like you just said that. You know, you, we've all had that kind of experience, right? I feel like I, I've heard you say that before. Like, we were just here, and I feel like that kind of deja vu. Well, I think there is a precursor to past life memories that we can sometimes identify as what I call even heightened deja vu. It's like what I call a recognition memory um, when maybe you fly into some city or you travel to some place in uh, South Dakota and you've never been there before, but you're standing on the plains and you feel like you've been there before. You're standing in the grass of the of the of our western our midwestern plains there in South in South Dakota, and you you know you've been there before. You have a knowingness, recognition memories. So a couple of examples of recognition memories. Um, that I've had. So when I was age five to nine, uh, my mom for several years, as I already told you, she was a Renaissance woman. She was an artist. She was a, she did abstract abstract paintings in the 1950s, way early. You know when uh, Jackson Pollock was doing stuff. Uh, my mom was playing with oil paints and doing 3D art and all kinds of crazy stuff when I was a baby. Um, 
she even had an exhibit at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. That's how, and she was a chemistry major at Boston University. That's how diverse my mom was. She was really, really a, a, a Renaissance woman, powerful woman in a lot of ways. We used to go there together. When I was five years old, my sister was a year old, a year, year and a half old. Um, my grandmother would babysit my sister. My dad would go off and do whatever guy stuff, probably get new hubcaps for his car or something. My dad was really into his cars. Um, and my mom and I would go to the Museum of Fine Arts when it opened on a Saturday morning. you got to understand, in 1956, this was not a popular place to go. It was just a dusty place. You know, every once in a while, school kids would go on an outing to the Museum of Fine Arts. And that, muse museums today are like hip places to go. You know, they're crowded. Not back then, especially not early in the morning on Saturday when everybody is you know, hung over from Friday night partying, probably, to be honest, right? So we were there pretty much alone. My mom would walk, we'd walk in through the lobby, and my mom would say, okay, Calvin, when Mickey, I had a Mickey Mouse watch, when Mickey's little hand is on the 11, and his big hand is on the 12, I'll meet you right back here. Two hours, I'd go off, want, this is where I would go, the Egyptian mummies and the medieval armor. That's where I went and hung out. Okay, go figure. I felt like I was just at home there. I know many of you have had this kind of experience, whether it's with things like this or whether it's places like this. When I was 20 years old and I went on a foreign study program and I went to the catacombs in the Appian Way in Rome and I knew I had been there. That's uh, St. Sebastian's right there, uh, this church right here above. Um, and and uh, it was, I think that was built in. 12 or 1300 or something. But down here, these are the catacombs. Those are, those of you who've been there, you know what I'm talking about. These are caves, labyrinths of caves and tunnels underground. They can stretch for many, many, many miles. One of them stretches for 10 miles. There's 10 miles worth of tunnels in one of them. Half a million people buried in one of them. That's just one of the catacombs. There are many of them outside of Rome. Um, and so uh, these are these indentations here are where they would bury people, obviously, because you're not going to bury them where you're walking. Um, but I came out of this tour with my college buddies and I had no idea. I was in time war. I had no idea. Was it five minutes? Was it five hours? I had no idea. I asked my friend. He said it was 25 minutes. I had no idea. I, but I had no knowingness. I had been there before. Another recognition memory. This is a friend of mine, Josephine, jewelry. She's unusual jewelry. That's a ring. That's a finger ring. Um, and she's, so I, so I, 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 she did what I tell people to do is follow the breadcrumbs. Okay. Follow the breadcrumbs. And I told her to follow the breadcrumbs. She started looking stuff up. Oh, she found a, a, a ring. A, she sent me a picture. This is what it looks like. Um, and then I said, well, follow the breadcrumbs. When was it made? Where was it made? Made in first century Egypt, sold in first century Rome. Then her memories started opening up about Rome. This is a tip that I give people about what to do about these fall of the breadcrumbs. Go to the library. In her case, she went to the internet. And I have friends who go to the library and just, you know, and I do that. I've done this in Austin, Texas, where I just go and I, okay, which book seems to attract me? And I find a book, boom. And I see, oh, does this resonate with me or not? The way this particular biographer, this particular historian is talking about that period of time or whatever. Or maybe even that person, if you think you were that person. And there, there's a biography written about it. Or go to museums and so forth, following the breadcrumbs. Um, so I'm going to bring, I'm going to tell you about this memory that I had as a slave. Um, I talk about this, the longer version, again, is in my book. Here's a short version because I want to open this up to questions and so forth in about five minutes or so. Um, and this experience that I'm going to tell you about my Carthaginian slave memory um, is going to tie back. Remember I told you that I had something that helped save my life uh, when I had my near-death experience and I almost drowned when I was 20 years old? I'll show you how this ties in. So I had this Carthaginian slave memory about 1979. Okay. My first past life memory started in 1977. 
I almost drowned in 1972, okay? So this memory is after, seven years after, my drowning experience. So you may wonder, like, well, how does that connect to helping you almost not drown? You didn't have this experience till seven years later. I'll show you. So let me just tell you the experience first. So my experience, and this is a teaching example for how these things can surface, because they can come in very disparate ways, nonlinear, doesn't make sense sometimes, and then later it'll make sense. So I was, um, I saw myself on a piece of wreckage, and I couldn't, I was on water, and I couldn't see land, so I thought it was on the ocean, okay? I was on the ocean, couldn't see land, and it was very, very hot. And I hadn't eaten for many, many days. I don't know how many days, but I hadn't eaten because I was incredibly hungry and I felt like I was almost dying. I was almost dead, almost dead on this piece of wreckage and it roasting. So I had all these different senses. It wasn't just vision. It started out visual. Then I started having the bit, the feeling, the sensation of the heat, the hunger, the, the feeling like I'm dying, etc. cetera, uh, the feel of the ocean water that was fairly warm on my foot and so forth, lapping up on me because I'm on this piece of wreckage that's maybe the size of a, I don't know, a big dining room table or something like that. Uh, and then I started having more memories. I started having visions of the boat that I was on and that I was a slave and that I'd been chained down and I was rowing in this boat. I said, oh, rowing. Oh, that's okay. So that's that's not 1700s. It's not 18. It's like a long time ago. So I start looking up pictures I followed the breadcrumbs. What did I say earlier? Follow the breadcrumbs, right? So now I'm following the breadcrumbs in this memory. I'm it's starting to unfold a little bit more since 1979. I don't. I, I never thought I'd be talking about my past life memory, so I never kept a journal. But I know this started happening in 79, and then over 1980, 81. Over this happens stretches out over years. It doesn't just all of a sudden download to you. That, that's not my experience anyway. Sometimes I'll have big pieces of past life memories come, but often not. Uh, by the way, we're going to talk more about my 6,000 years worth of past life memories. Barbara and I have talked about this, and I'm just touching on this uh, today. And um, uh, she said she wants to have me come back and just talk about my uh, reincarnation memories and how they unfolded in, in much greater detail from a teaching standpoint as well. But this one, um, here's what I took away. From, and it was in the Punic Wars. I figured out it was Rome. Carthage fighting the Romans, etc. The Romans had a unique ship. I don't need to get into the details of that now that I remembered that I was not on one of those ships. Okay. Anyway, that's how I knew I was Carthaginian and not a Roman slave. 330 BC. That old memory has fueled me today to help me because I willed myself to stay alive. That's the primary emotional, powerful thing I remember from that lifetime. I willed myself to stay alive until, I don't know, some fisherman or somebody came by and saved my life. So, you know, but I willed myself. The power of my mind has helped me through five layoffs since I was 50 years old. Five times, company bought, sold, get rid of all the senior execs. See you later. I'm on the street again. 50 years old, after me again, I don't know what, it's 54, 55, 58, 60, again and again and again. This memory has helped me get my resume together, put on a good face, put on a feeling of <laughs> that inner strength of tapping into my confidence for the hour or two or three or four hours I'm on the hot seat in the job interview to get the job, all right? This memory, and in retrospect, this memory saved my life in 1972. Not the memory, but the memory memory. In other words, not the 1979 memory of remembering this, but the fact that this was in my memory bank in, in the form of willpower, strength of mind, the knowingness of how strong my mind could be, pushed me back in out of my NDE into my body in 1972, and I forced myself to swim in. All right? 100 million piece jigsaw puzzle. We'll talk about this idea more in a, a future discussion when I talk about reincarnation experiences. But this is just to give you a sense. You know, you get different pieces of a lifetime. But one lifetime is like a 100 million piece jigsaw puzzle. You may just get small pieces of it. You don't know how many from each lifetime. 
I know about 25 different lifetimes uh, that I've had over the last 6,000 years. I know I've had more than that, but I have memories from 25 of them. Um, again, this is what I told you. What did it teach me about myself? That's, to me, the value of reincarnation memories, past life memories. Otherwise, who cares? It's party talk, cocktail party talk. You know, it's like, ah, I'm not here to repress people. I don't care. It's like, you know, but how is it know thyself, full circle, back to, we talk about it, back to what we talked about at the beginning. Virtue, turning within, getting rid of our fears, strengthening ourselves from the inside out. It's about knowing thyself. Whether you've had an NDE or not, it's about continuing to know thyself. I would argue that if you've had an NDE, it's incumbent upon you to continue to explore and turn within, not just get hung up on that one NDE you've had. All right? Like a lot of people I know do. All right? That's a, mis that's, that's a lost opportunity, quite frankly. Lost opportunity if you've had an NDE and you just keep coming back and revisiting that NDE. Move on, grow, self-develop, increase your self-realization through turning within and knowing more about thyself. Soul contracts, free will, destiny, yeah, free will all the time. That's my experience, having been on the other side many times in this lifetime and on the other side, in between having memories of being on the other side sometimes for hundreds of years before I come back, sometimes only the last lifetime I died in World War II. Uh, eight years on the other side before I came back. Free will always operates. Free will means what? Personal choice. We all, as souls, have individual choice. Even if we create a contract with other friends, loved ones, whoever, is, is it absolutely guaranteed that the things will happen that we agree upon? No. It's, nothing is guaranteed. There's no such thing as destiny in the way that people describe as absolute sureness, absolute fulfillment of a soul contract. No, because too many free will minds are in, in play that you do not have control over. We have control over, over our souls, our minds, our consciousness, our spirit. We do not control and manipulate, and we're not the puppeteer of other free will thinking souls. Therefore, the whole idea of absolute predestination cannot is, 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 is inaccurate. Free will exists. Now, can you have soul contracts and increase the probability that they will happen? Absolutely, yes. How do you do that? The stronger your mind, the more you've turned within and strengthened your virtue in the way that the ancient Greeks talk about virtue earlier in our talk today, then that's what gives us greater inner power because we all know and i'm talking to an audience i know i'm preaching to the choir here when i say it's the inside inside out approach it's the inside out approach it's strengthen ourselves from the inside right that's what makes us strong on the outside that means to increase the likelihood the probability that we can affect and make happen a soul contract the stronger we are the more likelihood that that will happen and that's where I think the idea of destiny comes from, because people do have soul contracts, and they, do, they are successful sometimes. So then people do see destiny, it happened. Well, that's kind of destiny, but it's not absolute. That's the thing. Okay? And then relationships over the millennia, I just want to leave you with some ideas here. What form may they take? Do they always work out? No. You can infer from what I just said. Are they always good? No. Relationships are not always good. How many of you come from families that are messed up? <laughs> you know, even if you choose to go in, it's like, what? You know, really? You should have heard me arguing with my dad when I was a teenager. You thought people were, if there were guns in the house, people would be dead. You know, if you were standing outside listening to us screaming at each other. You know, we, we, we you know, do we always have lessons to learn? Well, I did with my dad and I chose to, but not everybody does. So we don't always... We, you know, we could say, yeah, you always have them, but do everybody always choose to learn from them? No. This earth is, is not an absolute schoolyard. It's a school for those who, which, who wish to look at it that way. But you look around how many people are choosing not to look and not to learn, not to learn from their life, right? Summary. 
figure out in terms of this overall coming back home to what we're talking about today, overcoming the, the, the fear of death and you helping other people um, identify and overcome their fear of death. First thing is to identify what their belief is about death. Then you can help them reduce their fears. What's the bottom line message? Enjoy life. Now is the present. Now in the present, enjoy our lives in the continual present. We are all living in the continual present. That's what it's about. You do not have to believe in reincarnation. You do not have to ever have any experiences or memories of past lives in order to fully live your life as a fully developed human being, soul, spirit, consciousness in the present. There you go. This is my contact information. So uh, YouTube channel, you can just uh, Google me uh, or search, you know, uh, Kelvin Chin Turning Within is what the actual name is. But if you just type in my name, you'll find my YouTube channel. There's a lot of videos there. I talk in much greater detail about a lot of these topics there. Um, and feel free to Facebook friend me uh, or any of the other social media, etc. cetera. Uh, there's my website there, kelvinchin.org. I have four different websites. Just let me say very quickly, the easiest, quickest way to get around to the four websites is to go to the bottom of any page on any of them, and there are hot links to the other three. So that's the easiest way to get around. Kelvinchin.org is my more spiritually oriented website. So for this audience, you know, kind of makes sense. I have a separate one for death and dying issues. I have a separate one just for my meditation. And then I have a, a fourth one just about my books. Uh, and they're a summary of my, I have four or five books now in the works. One's published and the other ones are almost done. Um, so there you go. Feel free to text me. You got my cell phone number there. I, I do a free phone session with anybody about anything. So whether it's you, your friends, your family, free phone session worldwide, uh, like I said, about anything, okay? Um, maybe, Barbara, before we take questions, I'll just mention about what I'm speaking about at the IONS conference. Great. Um, yeah, I'm speaking day two. This is the IONS conference that Barbara had mentioned, referenced earlier at the beginning in the intro. Uh, August 14th to the 16th, so in a month, um, is the virtual online uh, IONS conference, and it's at virtual, the website is virtualconference.ions.org. Um, I'm speaking in the middle day, Saturday, August 15th, at 10 in the morning Pacific time. Uh, and the title of the panel that I am speaking on is called Healing Perspectives on Dying Alone. Healing Perspectives on Dying Alone and I'll translate that in English for you. What does that mean? I'll tell you what I'm gonna talk about. We haven't had a meeting yet with the other folks, the moderator and the other panelists, but I'll tell you what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about who meets us when we die. Where do we go? What's it like in the afterlife? And we can talk about this in the Q&A more because uh, I didn't get to that yet, uh, Barbara, but um, I'm gonna talk all about that in my uh, panel, all right? Who meets us? It's not just our loved ones. There's a whole a bunch of other folks and beings and so forth who meet us. Nobody ever dies alone. And it's to, it's that our panel in particular was specifically um, uh, created in 2020 for the IONS conference now because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the phenomenon where a lot of people are physically dying alone or you know seeing their loved ones on a smartphone or on a tablet because people can't go in and physically visit them, right? So that was the genesis of my particular panel. So we're gonna talk about how people don't actually die alone, even though there may not be anybody physically present with them other than a healthcare worker, okay? Beautiful, Kelvin, beautiful. That That is just the greatest talk and I'm so glad that it's gonna be available on Facebook for everyone to share as well as Great. go back and listen to many times. So we have a lot of comments here about Jada Delaney says, thank you, Kelvin. Virginia Jablonski says, great energy. 
Pam Osley says, thank you, Calvin, and thank you, Barbara, for putting this together. This information is so important to share. Thank you for being willing to evolve the consciousness. And thank you for helping us have higher understanding about who we really are. Infinite. Big, grateful hugs. We've got other comments that are so positive. It's like, wow. There's a comment that says, wow. Hello from <laughs> Seattle. So it's not just Santa Barbara that you're talking to Excellent. tonight. That was Excellent. Kathy Sterling. And then Claudia Logan says, we wish that we could have done this meeting in person as I've known Kelvin you for years as I was the one who recommended having Kelvin do a meeting for our I and Santa Barbara group. And luckily he agreed. She, uh, Claudia is on our board. Yes. And, yeah. Claudia is. Yes. Yeah. Sandy, yeah, Fitz, yeah. Sandy Fitzgerald says it feels good to be connecting again. And she was so anxious to hear about you. And so Peter Wright said that he was um, so happy about um, having the meeting tonight because we're all sheltering in place. And he was looking forward to hearing what you had to say. And, Crystal Amber says, Kelvin's definitely helped me. She's so thankful for you. And so there's Jada Delaney and Penelope Salinger and Adam Alexander, everybody that's here tonight. We just thank you all for coming. If there's any questions, you can post those on the Facebook page, and I will be happy to ask Kelvin to answer them. So I've got a thank you from... Michelle Saint, Michael Saint, Saint Sulpice, I can't pronounce that name very well. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not French. <laughs> and um, here's one question. What are the yeah. most interesting communications you've had with those in spirit? That comes from Penelope Salinger. It, most interesting? Uh-huh. Oh, boy, I've had so many. It started in 1986. Um, Archangels, angels came first and so forth. So I'm pretty familiar with the angelic realm. It's very hierarchical. I'll just give you kind of summary points about that. Very hierarchical, very belief oriented. So it's very much a belief centered, uh, not all of them. So th it's not monolithic. So it's not like, oh, the angel, boom. You know, it's, it's like it's like human beings aren't monolithic either, right? Um, so, but, but, but generally speaking, very hierarchical, very belief oriented, very much promoting those beliefs through psychics and channels and so forth on planet Earth. Um, uh, interesting t conversations that I've had. Um, you know, I, the, the most interesting ones that I still have ongoing now uh, are with some of the spiritual leaders who I briefly referenced who uh, were um, progenitors of the Judeo-Christian Islamic Vedic traditions. Um, so some of those conversations that started for me six years ago are some of the most interesting ones because, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that... See, I, I never really studied much of any of those traditions. I learned meditation, just to step back for a second, people understand a little bit about me. I learned, I didn't learn meditation to meditate uh, for spiritual reasons. I, I wasn't looking to, uh, for self-realization or any of those typical terms that you hear about meditation. I, I was, I was stressed out. I was a, I was a teenage college student stressed out and I needed help and I learned to meditate. And I, and I kind of researched a bunch of different techniques and I learned TM first uh, and I was, taught TM for Maharishi. I studied personally with him in 1971, 1973. And I was an international leader in that organization for about 10 years. Then they went in a different direction. I moved in a different direction. So I, I left that organization after about 10 years. But I learned because I was stressed out. Then I started spontaneously having these experiences and then communicating with the other side and so forth. So um, I guess the most direct way to answer that question was, is that, um, uh, uh, elucidating some of the very rational reasons why some things were done in those spiritual traditions that have now been taken way out of context and have become what we sometimes in my talks as trappings. Like, oh, you've got to 
have this candle exactly here or there or whatever. You have to do this or you have to do this there in a certain ritualistic way and where it came from originally or where it didn't come from uh, originally. Those are kind of the most interesting things for me because I'm kind of a little bit of a history buff and I kind of like uh, debunking some of the his, the uh, misstatements about historical things uh, that a lot of people that become folklore, so to speak, you know, and then fact from that. Um, interesting question. <laughs> Other questions? I don't have you any others talk, that are... Want me to talk about, you know, oh. let's talk about the afterlife. I didn't... Okay, great. I've got another question after you're done with that. Good. Okay. I, let's talk about the afterlife. So here's the thing about the afterlife. I didn't create any slides, of, about uh, additional slides about this uh, part of the talk because I thought I'd cover it in Q&A. People would ask me more. So maybe I'll give you some, uh, uh, some, 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 some ingredients to ask me questions from right now. Um, I think I say several things about the afterlife because I, my experiences, I, I, I have experiences over there now without having a near death experience. So that would, this would fall into the STE category, the spiritual transform, I guess, if you want to categorize them. to me, they're very normal. You know, I get my past life memories started in 1977 to present. My communication with the other side started in 1986 to present. Um, my being on the other side, you know, it's been going on for 20, 30 years or something like that. So it's very normal to me. These, 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 these experiences are not mystical to me. They're not far out. They're just like, it, it, yeah. And so part of my work is to demystify the mystical. I think we can think about these things in a much more normal fashion. And we can talk about them in a much more normal fashion. And we can analyze them in a much more normal fashion, in a rational fashion than I think uh, many people realize. So one of the things that I say when I talk about the afterlife is there's less difference between that side and this side than people realize. Now, people may go, well, wait a minute, hold on. You say, we don't have a physical body. <coughs> you know, yeah, okay, great. Yes, there are clear differences. The obvious ones we know. No physical, biological body on the other side. Um, but what I mean is right here. Those of you who can see your screens, I'm pointing to my head, my mind, my mind, my consciousness, just using my physical head as a symbolic representation. We know my mind is bigger than my physical head, but my brain, but it's this, this is, is, is not so different here and on the other side. We take our mind with us. If we take our mind with us, we don't all of a sudden become enlightened on the other side. That's not my experience. And it's not the experience of anybody that I've ever communicated with or visited. I visit the other side sometimes. I can see the other side. I can have conversations with the other side. It's not just them coming to me. It's like I can go there, so forth. It's, it's yes, it's a field of energy, yes, because there's no couch. There's no, you know, physical, hard, physical body objects, so forth. It's not dense vibratory field like it is here but it's right here we don't have to go anywhere we call it the other side because we're going to call it something so but it's right here it's it's right here and right now and um and and we have an ident what i call an identifiable energy pattern on the other side so my experience having many communications with maharishi mahesh yogi for those of you who may know he died in 2008 he's 90 something years old um this lifetime, he was an Indian guru. Transcendental meditation, TM, blah, blah, blah. He had a spiritual arm called the Spiritual Regeneration Movement. Some of you may have been involved with that back in the 1960s and 70s, um, even in the 19, 1959 when he first came uh, to the West. Um, it was Charlie Lutz's arm of the organization. I, didn't, I was not part of that because why did I start? I told you. I started because I was stressed out. I wasn't into spiritual stuff. Um, you know, so I was in the business education, um, reduced stress arm, we'll call it, of the organization. Um, but Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, I've had communications with him. I see his spiritual body. I see his energy body. We we'll call it spiritual body, his energy body. 
Uh, and then after that, I don't. He, he doesn't have to show me his. And I, by the way, I see him as his 50-year-old self because I only was with him in the 1970s. I had nothing to do with that organization since the late 1970s, 1978. And so, um, you know, I see him in the way that he portrays himself to me in a form in which I would recognize him. I didn't. I, I didn't see his. You know, when he was in his 90s and his 80s, I knew him when he was in his 50s. Okay, and then. He also, in another lifetime, he was John the Baptist, and he was Elijah, the prophet before that. Those of you may know anything about a little bit about the Old Testament, etc. So, in fact, he was John the Baptist. He was Elijah, and so so. He was also the Bob. Um, those of you who know uh, a little bit about the Baha'i faith, the Bob was the precursor to Baha'u'llah, so so were the co-founders of the of the Baha'i faith, an offshoot of a more liberal offshoot of the Muslim religion, Islam. Um, so. Uh, he has come to me, identifiable energy pattern. That's my point. And so then he comes to me. I don't have to see him anymore. I don't have to see his energy body. He's come to me. I can feel his presence. Or in one case, he filled me up with his body. As I felt his energy in my body. That was a that was a weird experience. Some of you may have had that experience before. And that's an unusual experience. Somebody comes into you and fills you up with themselves. And then that, that gets your attention. Trust me. Um, and uh, but I knew it was Marishi, and he asked me to do something and so forth. Um, and but other times he was just come. It's an identifiable energy pattern. My point is that Barbara, if you and I are dead on the other side, I would be able to recognize you, even if you did not show me your Barbara face from 2020. You might show me that in an energy pattern form, but then I would recognize you. I we are identifiable energy patterns on the other side. There is individuality. There is experience of the other side. Those of you who have had NDEs, obviously, have had experience of the other side, perhaps, if you had more classic NDE, not like my drowning one, but a more classic like NDE, like Jay's NDE, for example. Um, there's experience. If there's experience, there's individuality, there's an individual mind, there's your mind having that experience. Why do I say that? I say that because there's a lot of conflation and confusion and you'll hear in spiritual circles often, you'll hear this term, people will make this statement, which is incorrect. They'll say, there's no time and space on the other side. There's no time. Time doesn't exist in heaven. There's no time and space in heaven. Well, they're, if they're using that phrase, figuratively speaking, I get it. But you'll hear scientists say that. And if a scientist says that, you have to question, eh, you know, uh, I would not say anything to that person publicly, but I would say, look, you understand, right? Time is a measurement of change. That's what time is, a measurement of change. Well, time exists on the other side, even though the subjective experience of those of you who've had experiences over there, NDEs or STEs on the other side, know that the experience of time and space on the other side is really, really different from this side. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All right. It's just like you could say, oh, time doesn't exist when I'm on vacation. Yes, it does. I mean, my watch is still working. I'm on vacation. I may not look at it, and I may feel like the the, 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 the week just flew by, and oh, I got to go back to the office again. Really? Where did, the, where did the week go? Okay, I get it. We have the subjective experience of time that can be distorted or warped sometimes. That does not mean that there's, there's no change existing on when we're on vacation. No, time is a measurement of change. Change still exists when we're on vacation. Change still, exi change still exists on the other side. It's just changing at a very different rate than here. And so when you have an NDE and you go over and you feel like, well, I could be in like two places at the same time. I tell people, well, it, it may feel that way, but it's not actuality, reality, because think about it. So I try to give people teaching analogies that kind of make sense to, give, to make teaching points. So you think about it. It's kind of like, um, what can we measure if we're energy, which I think, which my experience is that we are uh, consciousness, but still identifiable individual individuality uh, type energy on the other side. As I said, individual identifiable energy pattern. But we're energy. What is energy on this side that is measurable? Light, light is measurable on this side. So I thought, from a teaching standpoint, analogously, 
how fast does light travel? And I, and I looked it up. And the exact figure is, you can look it up. It's 692,600,000 miles per hour. That's close enough. Round it off. 700 million miles per hour is the speed of light in the known universe that we have here in planet Earth, in Mars, Venus, blah, 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 whatever, solar system that we're in, the galaxy, etc. That's the speed of light, 700 million miles per hour. Now, I don't know how fast we can travel on the other side, but from my personal experience, I know we can travel really fast on the other side. I don't know how fast. I don't know if it's 700 million miles per hour, Earth miles per hour, because everything's time, space different on the other side anyway. But it feels to an Earthling, somebody who has experienced Earth, goes to the other side right away, it feels really fast. It's like stupid fast, right? And you feel like you could be in two places at the same time. And you're like, you feel like you are, but you're, you, you, it's like, how fast, let me just give you an idea how fast 700 million miles per hour. I mean, it sounds like a big number, but just to give you a relative idea, that's eight times around the equator of Earth in one second. That means you can get around the 24,000 miles, the fattest part of the Earth, the equator, one time in one eighth of a second, one eighth of a second. So if you have, let's say I die and I'm talking to my son and let's say he's acting, he's an actor. Let's say he's an acting in Tokyo and I'm talking to my daughter who's modeling in Paris, France, and I'm on the other side and I go to my son and I say, oh, I love you, I love you, I miss you. And then, he, and he, and then I go right to my daughter and I said, oh, I love you, I miss you. And, you know, and they call each other right away. They say, dad, just talk to me. No, dad, just talk to me. Well, we could be in two places at the same time. No, but to travel, let's say I can travel just for sake of uh, argument here, example, teaching example, maybe I can travel at 700 million miles per hour, the speed of light, because I'm energy. I am pure energy on the other side, okay? Individuated, but still pure energy. Do the, do the math, you know, Tokyo to Paris, what's, what's, how, what's the, you know, the, the distance? It's something like I could travel, do, do that in a 64th of a second. I think it's a 64th of a second ballpark. One 64th of a second. That's how fast. All right? So if I'm traveling at the speed of light, oh, maybe you can only travel at half the speed of light, 350 million miles per hour. Oh, it took me a 32nd of a second. You know, whatever. So I think these kind of experiences people have are genuine on the other side, for example, and it's completely understandable how people will come up with these ideas that, oh, there's no time, there's no space on the outside, blah, blah, blah. Time and space doesn't exist. But I don't think it's accurate. I think it's a conflation. But it's understandable. So, But time is a measurement of change. And change does exist on the other side. So time does exist. It's just a very, very different subjective experience of time from what we're used to here. All right? Now, give you another example of that. People who meditate, many of you meditate. Some of you are my meditation students. I've already heard some of the names of my meditation students. You know that sometimes during your meditation, you look at your watch and you go, what? That was 10 minutes? That was 15 minutes? It felt like it was 30 seconds. It was like, what happened? You know, just we, we all have this distorted experience of time. I would argue the more you turn within, the more regularly, consistently, every day, twice a day, turn within and meditate or do some other form of turning within, whatever works for you. I'm a big pragmatist, you know, whatever works for you, whether it's my technique, another technique, doesn't matter. Then you are increasing your familiarity with what I just described, this 350, 700 million mile per hour time space experience is not going to be so unfamiliar to you when you experience it. And I think that's another reason why, after two years of meditating twice a day every day, plus I'd been on all these other meditation courses with Maharishi by then, those of you who are listening to the details, I had already studied with him, uh, you know, personally, before my near-death experience, drowning almost experience, you know, in 1971, because the near-death drowning experience was 1972. So I had spent a lot of time within, a lot of time 
getting familiar with this different, we'll just call it time space distorted continuum thing. Um, so I think it's, I think it's also it has a very practical effect, not only of familiarizing ourselves from an experiential standpoint um, with um, the afterlife and, you know, if we ever have a near death experience of being not so stressful. I, I help people who have had stressful near death experiences, by the way, you don't often hear about that. So if anybody has had a very traumatic near death experience because they exist, they absolutely exist. They're not really uh, politically correct to talk about evidently at a lot of these conferences, uh, but they absolutely exist and people find me. And so I've helped people who've had traumatic near death experiences. They're not all pleasant. Um, and so anyway, back to the, my point of turning within and familiarizing ourselves is a way on a very practical level to strengthen ourselves through for, for all future experiences, including very radical spiritual experiences so that we, so that they don't overshadow us either. That's a subtle teaching point. Calvin, beautiful. That is very depth in depth and that's what they're wanting to hear. I've got a great qu set of questions for you. Yeah. Pam Osley is asking, have you heard any messages from the other side about the challenging times that we're in right now? Do they say why we're going through this or what the higher reason for this is? And she has multiple questions and where we're headed with this or have they said anything to you about um, does the veil between the existences and the worlds, are, is it getting thinner? Are people becoming more aware that others are on the other side? The others on the other side are there, and if so, why is this happening? Are we evolving our understanding? I think that, I think, it, look, first of all, let me just say at the outset, my, my personal experience goes back five to 10,000 years, okay? So I take the long view on things, so I want you to understand the context in which I, I'm answering this question, okay? So are we evolving as a human species is what I'm sure she's a asking, right? And, and the short answer is yes. Have we evolved over the last 10,000 years? Absolutely. And to the first person who asked me that unusual question that I've never been asked before, uh, one of the things that, you know, that was big, that, that, that our spiritual leaders in those various traditions really were concerned about 10,000 years ago was human sacrifice and mostly women and children because why because guys are stronger than women and children so you know the power thing and the whole thing but sacri human sacrifice to the gods and all the superstition along with that and that continued for many 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 thousands of years those of you who are history buffs out there know that right and so, yeah, look, we're not doing that. It's this it's improvement. Yeah, most people are not doing that stuff anymore. Okay, so huge improvement. Uh, <clears throat> I'd say at the outset, um, <clears throat> specifically what's going on as it, re as it relates to what's going on now. There's no reason for what's going on now. So people are always looking for reasons. Oh, is this like some mistake? Are we being punished? No, this is this. <clears throat> The, 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 the mistake in so far as accident, because uh, certain certain people eat certain animals and certain animals <coughs> were in a certain configuration and they and they tend to increase the probability of of, 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 of these weird viruses occurring. This is this is ongoing throughout Africa. It's not just in China. Those of you who know about this, these kinds of open markets it's it's africa there's some in south america and asia so this is kind of uniquely not the case where we have supermarkets in the western western europe and north america okay so um you know these kinds of things are going to happen and it's not nobody's foisting this on us from the other side so are there lessons to be learned absolutely but again what did i say earlier free will universe that means we can choose to learn lessons from this or we can choose not to and i think if you are candid you look around in the world the 2020 world i'm talking about we are right now 
and I, probably most of us are in the United States, so let's just talk about the United States. You know, may, some people may be here or watching this later from other parts of the world, I hope, uh, as well. But just to simplify this part of our discussion, let's just look at the United States that I'm familiar with because this is the country I've lived most of my life in out of the seven countries. You look around. Most people are not taking this time to be learning lessons about who they are as a human being. Is there an increase in that? Yes. So, the, so I want to answer your question in a positive fashion. That's yes, that has happened. Why? Because people are like they've got to be sequestered. They're home. They, they they're not crazy about being home. Nobody is. We want to be out, not about playing with our loved ones and friends and going here there to the beach and you know going to a bar and having a beer if that's what people want to do. Uh, but people are forced to kind of turn within to some degree. So there is some more self-reflection going on. Absolutely, yes. But what my experience has been, um, is, and this is worldwide, is that there's more stress going on because of that than self-reflection in a positive way that you're implying, whoever asked this question, than I think people realize. That more of the 7.6 billion people on planet Earth now are, yes, turning within and, and reflecting, but are, but are uncomfortable with it, okay? There's a, there's, a, there's a larger percentage. There's always going to be a subpopulation who are more self-aware. It's just the way it is. It's been like this since the birth of humankind on this planet. I have them being on other planets. We'll talk about that in another session and so forth. Are there different um, uh, cultures on different planets? Absolutely, yes. But I tend to come back to this one a lot. Um, this planet a lot, <laughs> um, but I've been in all the different cultures on this planet as well in different lifetimes. Um, but but we have grown, but there's always a subpopulation who's going to be a little more uh, cognizant and of, of about this turning within in a positive way, as opposed to turning within and just masking it and Netflix binging or getting drunk, you know, because there's a lot of that just going on, quite frankly, in the world. Um, you, you know, the, the liquor and the wine got cleaned, cleaned up, you know, along with the toilet paper. Those two things were the first things off the shelves that I saw. Toilet paper and alcohol. Go figure. <laughs> but um, I, I'm not sure if I answered everything in that question. I think you could ask it to me again, Barbara, if you see any pieces of that. Well, I think maybe just talking about the higher, is there a higher reason? Do you, do you, I think you've kind of answered that. Okay. Higher reason for the COVID-19? Yeah. No, not no, really. There's huh? no higher reason for us getting this COVID-19. That, that it goes to the, it goes to the notion that some people have that people are puppeteering us, that they're, they're, they're like orchestrating stuff on the other side. No, there's no orchestration going on. Nobody's pulling puppet strings and like throwing it's, it's, it, people still sometimes have this Mount Olympus view that some of the Greeks used to have. Even when my ancient Greek lifetime, we used to laugh at that. I mean, we, we but, the, but the masses believed in Mount Olympus, you know, and the Greeks, would, you know, they, you know, oh, yeah, and they come down and they procreate with humans and they go and they, and they play with you, they throw darts at you and do stuff. No, that's not happening. There's this, this, this virus, can we use it is the way I would like this question to be reframed right. can we as a human race use this as an opportunity to grow absolutely. i would absolutely say yes let's absolutely. use this opportunity as, as an opportunity to grow mm -hmm. and, and and the black lives matter and so forth uh etc 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 um covid19 the sequestering use it as an opportunity to grow that's the, that's how i would reframe it Beautiful, beautiful. That is beautiful. That is how we're going to end our evening tonight so people will think about how are they going to grow through this and what they're going to gain from this rather than what they're losing from it. Yes, we right. are losing people, but yes, we are gaining as well. Find out what you're gaining and look at that instead. 
So thank you so much, Kelvin, for the talk You're tonight. Very really appreciate you being here. And we thank everybody who checked in with us tonight and all the people in the future who are going to be watching this. Goodbye from Ion Santa Barbara. Kelvin?